uh, that's where we had dad's memorial when he died. And, and that's where uh, Julie Ream would have the silver spur was in those banquet halls. And those are all gone. A lot of people have those, but cause that's where Dan Haggerty's memorial was too. They were saying yeah, it was, it's very convenient and it's, it's very familiar to everybody in the industry and everybody that grew up in the Valley. How come they knocked it down? I figured everybody would, somebody would want to preserve it, wouldn't they? Uh, they wanted to, but the owners decided to put in a strip mall because that's more important. There aren't any in the valley, you know? <laughs> Not enough in the valley. <laughs> oh, here's a, already we got some great information from Andrew J. Clyde. David Dortort got a Golden Boot Award in 1999. <laughs> I think he shows it to everybody in the video we're showing tomorrow morning as he gives his tour around his house, which will be interesting. It's The, the boot was a very, very important thing uncle bob had his proudly displayed it, more so than any of his other awards i mean it was because it was from your peers oh is that how they chose so did your dad yeah. have one too no really no nope. so does dad he was the first one to get a silver spur but he didn't get a golden boot <laughs> <laughs> i love all these names of the different types of awards <laughs> <laughs> amongst their peers. I love it. Yeah, Don, Donna Martell was the one who presented dad's silver spur. I'm sure Andy would know. I know the name sounds familiar, but I'm drawing a blank right now, probably because my brain is fried. Who was Donna Martell? Uh, she did. Oh, gosh. She, she was a, a hottie. Um, I know. Andy just puts a great actress. Want to be a little more yeah. specific? <laughs> <laughs> I'm and thinking a great Andy. lady. A great lady. I just talked to her last oh, week. Oh, Twilight Zone. She must have done a couple Twilight Zones. Okay. Yeah, cool. the, she did. A, she did a lot of things. A ton of westerns, but she was quite a little sex pot in her day. <laughs> Steve looked at the pictures and went, "That's Donna." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have 14 people in here, so that'll be a good start. Uh, as I will reiterate this again, that uh, if you have any questions for Cindy in the course of our chatting tonight. Uh, please post them in the Q&A and not in the chat because I don't look at the chat list. So it'll be much quicker. You would get it much quicker or an answer possible quicker in the Q&A. <laughs> I just say that. Okay. Anyway, so introducing Cindy Mitchum Asbel. Her father was John Mitchum, who many of you would know as a, a recurring character in several of the Bonanza episodes. I think he was in like seven or eight that he yeah. pops up in. I, I have no Andy idea. sent me the list and it was like seven or eight. It was quite a few. So, but he was definitely a very familiar face. Um, so tonight we're going to chat about him, but Cindy also had been on the set quite a bit with her dad. So she actually, and that's right. Her father had done the album that you all are probably familiar with that is called our land, our heritage. Is that the correct, correct name that uh, John did the words and the music and then Haas well, didn't quite sing, did he? He did no. a lot. <laughs> or, no. or spoke the words. <laughs> Narration. <laughs> Narrated while John sang and played and, and did that. So um, how old were you when they were doing all that? Well, I realized that Dad first met Dan in a Cimarron City before I was even born. Oh. So, yeah. So their friendship went forever. Um <laughs> <laughs> Truly. And by the time um, they got to Bonanza, their friendship was absolutely solid. So I I knew Dan my entire life. So were they more connected because of the singing or were they more connected because of drinking or <laughs> just, <laughs> just had a lot in common? Or <laughs> Oh, uh, well, the... the they had their differences, especially politically, um, but but they were, I mean, they were two peas in a pod, literally. And Dan was the only person that was ever bigger than dad um, <laughs> in my childhood. You know, dad was like this, well, he had a 22-inch neck and a 52-inch waist when I was growing up, my dad. So Dan oh was bigger. Oh, my gosh. Dan was bigger than dad. Wow. Yeah. And you got to visit the Bonanza set? Yeah. So yeah. what are your what yeah. are your memories? You know I'm gonna make you go through the list. What are your memories of we'll start with well we'll start with well Dan Blocker will put at the end since you probably have more memories of him. So did you meet Michael Landon? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I was raised um, with all the the etiquette that a, that an LA kid was supposed to have at that point. So, I learned at a very very young age not to talk when the red light was on because I was a bad no no. So, <laughs> so I would just be you know quiet and polite, but have have fun, and it was just great fun to be around all those people. Now, did you have a favorite episode? Like. Did you watch the show or? Oh, we watched it all the time. Um, uh, no, I didn't have a favorite one. I, <laughs> uh, 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 they were all just, you know, wonderful. And it was, it was, um, it, watching everybody and having them in my living room at the, you know, same time. Um, like I told Jim Jury one day, I said, I didn't realize how famous you were. <laughs> And he said, that's because we're just Uncle Dan and Uncle Jim in your living room. You know, I, I knew that I could watch him on TV, but I could watch my dad on TV, too. So I, I had no, no comprehension of how widespread their, their stardom was. Ah, gotcha. Gotcha. Um, oh, Andy's got another comment. One of the fascinating aspects of Dan and John's friendship is they were quite far up. Oh, she already said that. Andy, you got to catch up here. We already talked about that. <laughs> or I missed the question. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, what about Purnell? Did you ever meet Purnell? I did. I, you know, like I said, he, very charming, very kind to me as a child. So it was, yeah, you know, some, some actors aren't so kind to children. They, you know, don't take the time to be pleasant, but he was always very kind and gracious. About how old were you when you were visiting the set? Are you like a teenager or were you? Oh, no, I was, I started uh, like five, six. So I was little. So like I said, I had my, my manners and etiquette that I had to follow so that I didn't disrupt anything and stay out of everybody's way. But it was, it was great fun to be with everybody and watch it all happen. So it was, it was kind of a blur between reality and and fantasy because to me it was reality because I was there. And did you go to a public school or did you go to like Hollywood High or something like no, that? I, like, I went you... to my elementary and junior high were both walking distance from our house in the valley. I'm a pure valley kid and then I went to two years at U.S. Grant High School in in the valley and by my senior year, I told my parents I can't wow. do this anymore because there were undercover police and it was just a ridiculous situation. And I said, I'm not learning anything, so I don't want to go back. So my senior year, they put me in Hollywood professional. Oh, okay. So you were with ho other Hollywood kids? Yeah, but it was, it, I, I grew up with other, you know, dad's friends' children. So but I also grew up with a mixture of like my next door neighbor's father worked for the Department of Water and Power. And a, the other next door neighbor was a, um, an insurance salesman. So it was just a normal San Fernando Valley childhood as far as I was concerned. So how did your neighbors treat your dad? They must have known he was, because he was like in everything. So did they treat him any different or did they? Oh, no, they they would love to come up and say, oh, we saw you on such and such, whatever it yeah. was last night. <laughs> and dad would just smile and say, well, thank you. And he'd be very gracious about it. And they would try and figure out, weasel out a way to figure out how much money dad made. And he'd never <laughs> tell them that. But one of dad's favorite stories was when they had first moved into the house, the Helms Bakery truck came by, which if you were from LA, that was a very very integral part of of an exciting experience it was a yellow kind of like a station wagon almost like a hearse looking thing and the bell would ring and people would put their signs up in the window and they would stop it outside your house and you'd run out and they had a whole drawer wooden drawer full of brand new fresh baked donuts that you could pick and they had bread and all kinds of other things a bakery truck and so dad was getting donuts and and a neighbor down the street kind of looked like the cartoon character of the, the cratchety old woman with her house coat and her slippers and her pink hair curlers. <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. She came up to dad and looked at dad and said, I want, I want you to know that the glamour and glitter of Hollywood isn't lost on me. <laughs> so dad just went, oh, okay. Good to know. <laughs> nice meeting you. 
<laughs> That's funny. So do you have any memories of meeting Lorne Green? He was, I was kind of intimidated by him. Not that he ever did anything, but his voice was so powerful that it was just a little, I, I shied away from him, which is <laughs> funny because Dan being so big didn't phase me at all. But Lauren, I just sort of, I, I knew instinctually to have a little more respect for him and just sort of stay away. <laughs> Which of course leads us to Dan Blocker. So Dan Blocker must have obviously known you. So he was probably always saying hello and chatting away. But you had mentioned that you also would go to his, his house and hang out with his kids. Oh yeah, if that was a big exciting thing because they had a color TV. So we'd go on, <laughs> we'd, go, so we'd, we'd go on Sundays and then we could watch the wonderful world of Disney in color with the, with the peacock, with the colors instead of black and white. That was big time, but his kids and my brother Jack, my one of the twins, Debbie, was my brother's first crush, and oh. so we had Debbie and Dina and and Dirk and David, and we would all play together and and go swimming and have barbecues while the four adults did whatever the heck they were doing, and <laughs> talking. You know, the sixties, a lot of politics were being talked about, but Dad and Dan did an awful lot of charity events together, and they did the album together which took a while to put together and my uncle bob wrote the liner notes on the back of that oh and really yeah it, it was oh. actually dan is the one who said that dad should do the album and joe reisman who was the head of rca at the time was a good friend of my uncle bob so uncle bob arranged a meeting and it was supposed to be a 10 minute meeting and three hours later dad walked out with a signed contract nice to do the album but and to me it's a, a remarkable album i'm extremely proud of that album i think it's just beautiful and so that when they were preparing that they were together all the time doing that and then dan did a lot of as i said charity work and he did things and like he took dad with him on a junket to the um, prison in texas which dad had to do and sing in, in a thunderstorm which is a whole nother story with dan saying don't touch the mic but and then then they went and saw some of dan's old army friends from the korean war so that you know they were they were good good friends so they were able to check their politics at the door as people like to say well they would have their debates but it didn't it isn't like in today's realm where if somebody that has been your friend for 40 years or a family member disagrees with you, you disown them. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't that climate at all. It was, let's, let's discuss this. What's your viewpoint? Why do you feel that way? Try and change my feeling about it. <laughs> uh, let's see. So I know everybody's going to want me to ask this question, but which was your favorite Bonanza character? <laughs> I think it's Haas because, it was, because he's such a goofball. You know, I mean, he, he it, you know, every everybody wants a little joke because he was the heartthrob, but but Haas was just just the way Dan was, just a kind of lovable goofball. <laughs> Do you have any particular memory, like of, of with him or him coming over to your house that you would want to share? The funniest childhood memory I have is we had six foot wall cinder block walls on three sides of our backyard. And we had a pool naturally. And dad and Dan, had, they had a few drinks and they had a, one of those little tiny styrofoam paddle boards that, you know, that were probably mine or my brother's and they would throw it in the middle of the pool and then run and jump on it into the pool. And if they hit it right, then like this huge like Samu the whale gush of water would come out of the pool. If they hit it wrong, it would go straight up in the air and go over the six foot walls. And we'd have to go get the styrofoam thing and bring it back to them. And they thought that was the funniest thing in the world. These two huge men jumping in a pool and a little tiny toy. <laughs> I'm sure you guys all thought it was hilarious too. That had to have been funny to well, see. Well, until you got tired of going over the wall. 
you know? <laughs> and he said, I'm going inside. You guys do whatever you want to yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. But they, 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 like I said, the two of them did a lot of charity work together. They, one in particular was a, a make, making sure that a boys home came together out in Acton. And I just, again, did some research and the Episcopal priest who put it together needed $5,000 to buy 80 acres out in Acton. Wow. Yeah. $5,000 for 80 acres. Now you can get a house for $600,000, you know? <laughs> oh, in it's that like, area? Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. Something. Anyway, but they, dad and Dan were very instrumental in making it all happen. And, and they put together a huge charity event at a place called Devonshire Downs. And they roped in all of the Western stars and they all came, the Sons of the Pioneers came and, and it was just an amazing day long and all night long festival of all the Western people that were donating their time and they earned the $5,000 and Father Garrett was able to buy the ranch for cash. But Dan was very instrumental in making that happen with dad. Does he still own the ranch or did they, have they sold it? Father's passed away, then? but it, the ranch existed for 30 years. So wow. imagine how many boys went through that ranch in 30 years time. And the, the objective was to find boys that were in juvenile hall in the system whose parents really didn't want them. So that they, and to, to give them a true home, not a, not a, federally funded or a state funded institution, but a home with guidance and love so that they could grow into productive young men. Well, it sounds like the Western community was really a tight knit community. I mean, even today, it seems like a lot of the same people are doing the same, you know, doing the different Absolutely. Western shows. It seems like everybody knows, because you know, like I talked to you, but you knew Michael McGreevy and I talked to Darby and Darby knew you and Michael McGreevy. And then you talked to Bobby and Bobby knows you and Michael, <laughs> like everybody well, seems to know everybody. Even if you haven't seen each other in years, it's like, you still. No, it was, it was a very, other. very, it was, it was a, it's, I've never seen, you know, like using an insurance salesman as a, as a equation, an insurance company would not have employees that were that, close and that protective and that loving year after year after year, you know, maybe while, while your coworker is at the desk next to you, but 50 years later to still be there in a heartbeat, if anybody needs you, that's, that's unheard of, but that's how they all were. And that's how they still are. So when you visited the set, did you, did you visit any of your dad's other sets or was Bonanza really the only one you ever? No, I, I went on several of them. The one that, the only one that really surprised me and shocked me was the Bewitched set. For some reason, I thought that was going to be a real house. <laughs> but when I got there and it was just a big front, I was devastated. I was just so crushed that, that Bewitched wasn't real. Why out of everything that dad did, I thought that that show would be, you know, a reality, but I knew everything else wasn't. So I don't know. It's just a weird kid's mind. But no, it was, it was, and when dad would go on location, we'd go with him and be able to have fun and, and just be a part of that whole magical world. And it, it's not the, as you know, knowing Mike McGreevy and, and Darby and Bobby, that it's not the stardom. It's, it's their inner being, their, their true people and how wonderful they are. That that's, that's what I love. You know, because uh, sometimes when we had interviewed or I had interviewed Paul Peterson a while ago. And, you know, obviously there's some child actors who haven't made the, the transition very well. But then there's those that seem like they're very well adjusted. You know, like Bobby was saying, yeah, I don't ever see anybody getting in trouble. And Darby obviously seems well sorted out. But did you ever observe anything on any of the multitude of sets that you were with your dad that they treated anybody any differently or not really? Well, as far as children versus yeah. adults, um, Stefan Arngrim is a friend of mine, and Stefan uh, was on the way west with, with Uncle Bob and Richard Widmark and Kurt Douglas, and Dad was on it, obviously. And it was the last epic Western ever filmed. It was a fantastic cast of characters. And Stefan was only eight years old, and he played Kurt Douglas's son in the film and 
Stefan told me, he said that the way that dad and uncle Bob treated him was like an adult. He wasn't like the little kid on the set. Mm. And he true. I mean, it wasn't like they expected him to do adult things, but they, they listened to him and they, they interacted with him and he truly, that, that touched him deeply to be treated that way and not just shunted off in the corner or something. Right. But it was, it was, it was a transition time at that point. You know, it, it, everything was the sixties were, were a big time of growth for the industry and how they were coming about with different rules and regulations and even insurance and residuals and rules and regulations of how to take care of people. So it was, it was a growing spurt and I think they got it all straightened out. Did your dad ever encourage you to try to go into the business or did you not have any interest? Um, whatever I wanted to do, my parents would have let me do. And my dad's agent really wanted me to go in and, and be an actress. But I was a very odd child. I, I knew that it cost a lot of money if somebody blew a scene. And I didn't want to be responsible for somebody spending money for my mistake. So that's why I never did it. So you, didn't even, you didn't even try it? You didn't even go on a single audition? Nope. Had no desire at all. I did modeling. Then I, I didn't have to say anything and I didn't blow lines. So I just walked <laughs> around and they took <laughs> me. It was much easier. Now, did you ride yeah. horses or anything? Were you a, a cowgirl at heart or anything? No. I, I, no. I, I was a strict valley kid. My, my cousin Trina, my cousin Chris, fabulous horseman. You know, I, uh, I went to a, a rodeo that Dean Smith put on for the John Wayne Cancer Society. And Dean had several people, including my cousin Chris, and I was so totally out of character. I was jumping up and down and yelling and screaming, which was, my mother would have had a fit if she'd seen me behave that way. But I'd never seen my cousin ride, and I was very impressed. But no, I never, I never did anything like that. My mother was from Nebraska, so I was always very sedate. <laughs> <laughs> You inherited that from her, huh? <laughs> it was just her upbringing, you know? She just behaved the way you're supposed to be behaving. So did your mother have any roots in the business? Like, how did your dad meet your mom then? No, my mother was going to school at Colorado College. And dad was going through a very horrible divorce. He was originally married to Gloria Graham's sister. So he was in the throes of this awful divorce and was drinking quite heavily. And uncle Bob called him up and said, okay, I got you a job. You're leaving town. You're getting away from all this mess for three days. And dad said, great. So it was just a small little part, but just to get out of town. And, and they went to Colorado Springs. It was a picture called one minute to zero with uncle Bob and Charlie McGraw and Hal Baylor. And dad did his three days. Dad was really, with Hal Baylor, which I'm sure that was a, a story unto itself, but <laughs> but they they did their thing, and Dad was done on Friday, and the dailies came back, and they said, "Oh, I'm sorry, one of the extras they had hired some of the Air Force cadets from the Air Force Academy there in Colorado Springs to wear the correct uniform and be extras." Well, one of them didn't change and was wearing the the modern day current uniform and it stood out like a sore thumb that they were gonna have to reshoot the scene on Monday. So they said, you have to stay. Dad said, fine, he didn't wanna go back to the mess anyway. A freak snowstorm hit and they were stuck there for six weeks. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so dad got to hang out with Charlie McGraw and Hal Baylor and Uncle Bob for an extra six weeks. And they went to a underground nightclub and we're listening to some jazz music because the, the train would stop in Colorado Springs and on the way to Chicago. And my mother was at another table with a couple of other sorority sisters. And my dad actually told my mom that night that he was going to marry her. And my mom laughed and said, I'm, I'm engaged and the invitations have been sent out. <laughs> oh, no. So... <laughs> What said, yeah. Well, two weeks later, she had to call my grandmother in Kearney, Nebraska, and tell her to turn off the wedding, which was, <laughs> you know, not the social thing to do in 1950. So, and and Uncle Bob had just gone through his little episode with being in the newspaper all the time. So that really put my grandmother in a tizzy that <laughs> my mother was going to marry into such a horrendous family. And so they 
they got married and they were married until my mother passed away and they'd still be married if she, if they were both alive they just absolutely adored one another <laughs> and she had no ambitions no anything to be in the business she was gonna be a social worker did she care that he was in the business like that didn't bother her it was just a job kind of thing she thought of or she, what well she was 100 percent supportive and did what a wife did in the 50s and supported him every way that she could. She had the appropriate cocktail parties and she always made sure that he had the right outfit on wherever he was going, whatever event he was doing. And, you know, it wasn't like she was like jumping up and down. Oh, I snagged an actor. It was just, <laughs> it, he was happy, you know, and, and he also sang a lot. He, he sang for the LA school district and every Sunday we had to go down to Pershing Square and he had sing-alongs at Pershing Square oh, and wow. she, he would get us all dressed up and we'd be in like, almost like a church pew in Pershing Square and do the sing-alongs of Bicycle Built for Two but so she did <laughs> what was expected and and she was very proud of him but it wasn't that you know she was she was not a gold digger by any means so was he, a, he thought of himself more as a singer than an actor or did he think of himself? Well, he, singing was his, his first passion and, and he actually trained to be an opera singer. Really? Yeah. And wow. um, there's a house in Coldwater, Laurel Canyon. And he was living in Long Beach with Uncle Bob and my grandmother. And he would hitchhike from Long Beach to Hollywood three times a week. And that was before freeways were around so that was an all-day event just to take <laughs> singing lessons and then he would wash all the windows in this mansion to pay for the singing lessons so he was very serious about his singing and had neither uncle bob or dad had any ambition to be an actor they just it just happened so dad was walking down hollywood boulevard a true story and they came up and asked him if he was an actor and he said no and they said have you ever thought about it and he said how much does it pay <laughs> <laughs> so his his first movie was in 1947 called The Prairie. <laughs> so, are we able to find it anywhere or did it end up in public yeah, domain yeah. somewhere? <laughs> no, it, it, I think you can see it on YouTube and I think you can get the DVD on on online at Amazon. But yeah, that was his very first film. And it wasn't like he had great desire and went out to audition or anything. They just sort of tapped him on the shoulder. He was that story. He was that one in a million that everybody always now dreams about that's going to happen to them. Yeah. So that's well, Uncle, cool. Bob, Uncle Bob got discovered because my Aunt Julie, their older sister, was a vaudeville tap, tap dancer. And she left home when she was 12 to join the vaudeville team and married a sailor and got stuck in Long Beach. So she joined the Long Beach Players Guild and she coerced dad and uncle Bob to join because there was only one man and 30 women. So, <laughs> yeah, so uncle Bob didn't sign me up. So he was, he was doing that and they discovered him and, and got him into his first Hopalong Cassidy movie. Oh, wow. That's but it was crazy. like I said, it, it wasn't a great drive and ambition for them to do it, but it, it was meant to be. <laughs> All right, let's see. We got some questions over here. Let me see if I can uh, see what we got over here. Uh, Andy says, Riverboat was something of a rival of Bonanza, along with Laramie, debuting on NBC in 1959. What are your recollections of Riverboat, and how did your dad get the part of Pickalong? Because he could sing. Um, yeah. I, dad, actually, he never saved really anything from any shows or episodes that he did except his guitar from Riverboat, which I still have. So dad, dad could sing and dad would take his teeth out. So <laughs> a lot of actors are a little vain and wouldn't do that, but dad would, you know? So that's, he got pick along because he could sing and, and he would take his teeth out. So he was, it was Burt Reynolds' very first TV show and Darren McGavin was on it and Mike McGreevy and this little monkey that Mike will tell you about, which I found pictures of the monkey at my birthday party the other day. But Oh, I saw you had posted that and Mike, yeah, Mike yeah, that was, that monkey was responded really to it. That, one of the reasons dad always had a beard was because he didn't have one when they hired him for Riverboat. So he had to wear that mustache with spirit gum and he found out he was very allergic to spirit gum. Plus the monkey chewed the mustache all the time. 
So he decided it'd be easier just to have his own if they wanted it and then shave it off if they didn't want it. But but so dad was on riverboat and then he would sidle over and do Laramie and then he'd go do some Bonanza. I mean, dad, because of the fact that he would take his teeth in and out, he could play double the roles. And you had told me a story about how your dad had gotten the, that was it his lip? What, what yeah, was the one you had said? Well, they call it a pitcher lip because it was bent over, you know, like a like the lip of a pitcher. And he was four and Uncle Bob was six. And my grandmother had sent them to mail a letter at the corner. And Uncle Bob let go of dad's hand and he ran into the street. And he got run over by one car. And as he was trying to get up, a second car ran over him. Oh, my gosh. So he was, well, you got to remember, it's like 1923. So it wasn't like cars of today's standard. So I guess I'm Uncle shocked Bob, there was that many cars on the road at the, <laughs> that close by each Bob, other. But <laughs> Dad's lying in the street, and the the you know the people are trying to help him. And Uncle Bob runs home to my poor grandmother, that poor woman, and he said, "Jack's been hit, but he ain't dead yet." <laughs> so my poor grandmother comes running to the scene, but they it shattered Dad's jaw, and they had to wire it shut, and they also had to put oh. a steel plate in his head, and. They put dad in the hospital naturally with his wired jaw. And the day before he was supposed to come home, a measles epidemic hit the hospital. So he had to stay in quarantine another two weeks. So oh there gosh. he was. There he was in a wheelchair with, you know, his jaw wired shut. But he would sing through this wired jaw and it would make people smile and be happy. And that's when he realized that singing was a, was a gift to make people happy. So it was another meant to be an event for him. But his lip was never the same because of the broken jaw. But it became his signature, so I guess you never know. <laughs> yeah, that, you know. <laughs> Andy Devine's voice and dad's lip. I know, right? <laughs> uh, here's another one. Did your dad and Dan ever have spirited oh, political discussions to the best of your recollection, or did they just avoid discussing politics? No, they, 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 they went head to toe dad was very staunch republican and he was campaigned for barry goldwater he was he and jim jury actually did opening acts for the goldwater campaign oh wow so, yeah so so and I, I said everybody argued in the 60s but they had very <laughs> they had very different opinions of how things should be did they make sure they weren't drinking while they were having their discussions or <laughs> What are you drinking? <laughs> I, I was going to say, that probably made them even more spirited, part in the pun, right? <laughs> well, they, yeah, they, they, I mean, those two never got angry or, or rowdy with each other. I mean, can you imagine those two bulls going after each other? That would have been, <laughs> oh man, that just, you know, it's embarrassing when you're in a kid and, and your dad or his friends sit down on somebody's couch and the legs break off, you know, it's... <laughs> Did that happen? It's, of course. <laughs> you know, it's, it's you know, that's kind of stuff is like, oh, geez. You know, we went to a, a wedding and everybody had been drinking. And the next day, somebody came over with a full cast on their arm from their fingertips to their shoulder. Dad had shattered his arm in three places doing arm wrestling. Oh, no. <laughs> I, so, so it was yeah, never so a dull moment when he was around. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, no. So it, dad and Dan had to be careful. You know, I mean, they didn't ever spank any of the kids because they knew that it could really hurt. I mean, they they didn't have to anyway because we didn't want them to spank us. <laughs> they, they were just huge. They were huge, huge men. That's so funny. Um, I think you kind of already explained this. How did your dad and Dan come to work together on their record album? You had said Dan suggested it, but did how did he know that John sang just because of Dad never stopped singing. Dad would sing in the grocery store. Dad, I mean, dad, dad always sang. It was just, and dad had a love of history. And th that's what our land, our heritage is about is it's a quilt of Americana of why was that particular song written? What was going on in the country? That that song was written and why did that song stay and another song written in close proximity never survived. So it's it's a wonderful learning tool to open up your eyes and, and the fact that it, it showed 
that we are not more than a melting pot, but the, how this, the Scottish music is what is now Appalachian music. Mm. You know, it's just, it's just a brilliant piece of work that they did together. Uh, let's see what else. Um, who was your dad's agent? What are some parts your dad auditioned for but didn't get and anything he regretted turning down? Dad's agent was a was a stereotypical agent. His name was Bob Brandes. And Bob, Bob was from New York and he had black horn rim glasses and a really bad toupee and drove a black Cadillac and was just as as textbook agent at that point as could be. And um, Bob would I, I, go to the, like the Universal, for example, in the commissary and somebody would say, hi, how are you doing? Bobby said, you haven't hired any of my guys for two weeks. Don't say hi to me. And he'd walk away from them. <laughs> but, but if my mother no, didn't drive due to health reasons. And so if dad was on location, Bob would kindly go get his check, cash the check, pick me up from school, take, come and get my mother, take her grocery shopping and take her back, find an agent that would do that now, you know? Mm. But the only thing that I remember dad auditioning for that really perplexed him was a commercial for some sort of cigarette. And dad never smoked a day in his life. <laughs> so he had to inhale and he said, the smoke never came out. And I'm like, well, you probably didn't do it right, dad. So that was, that was the only thing that he ever, now dad was, Mike McGreevy told me that there were two casting directors that had stables and everybody what it was their dream to be in one or the other of the stables and he said your dad was in both of them and i clearly remembered like the phone would ring at six o'clock seven o'clock at night and it would be bob brandy's or the casting director directly saying you've got a six o'clock call the messenger's bringing a script over wow and so dad just very seldom did he actually go out and audition for anything they just called him was there ever a part though that he saw later and said, oh man, I can't believe I would have been perfect for that. I can't believe they didn't cast me for that. Or I, I think every actor has that feeling, you know, of, or I, I, I could have done it better or whatever it might be, but nothing in particular really stands out. He had favorite lines. The, the, the sheriff in, when he was in High Plains Drifter and the, he was letting the bad guys out and they said when we got here we had two good horses and he said what do you think you've been eating the last three months <laughs> that, that was his favorite line of all time <laughs> and what did he think of clint eastwood when he was in the dirty harry movies or movie he i guess clint were very good friends they were actually friends even before rawhide um clint was a house painter with a guy named george fargo who was a dear dear friend of uncle bob's and dad's and so they were all just friends before anything happened. And then Clint got onto Rawhide and dad did a lot of Rawhide with, with Clinton, with Denver Pyle and that whole gang of people. <laughs> and then dad actually did six films with Clint. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, Boy, he was right. busy. I bet his resume goes on and on and on and on. The, the IMDb resume doesn't even touch the tip of the iceberg of what dad yeah. actually did. But dad did three Dirty Harry's. He did. Paint Your Wagon, High Plains Drifter, and Outlaw Josie Wales with Clint. Oh, huh. That's amazing. Um, cousin Trina Mitchum wrote a nice book on Hollywood horse info. Uh, Cindy might enjoy jumping in the horse. He, oh, he's talking about something else. Did you know Fat, did you know Fat Jones that ran the stable for the Bonanza? I met him, but obviously dad knew him a lot better than I did. But I, I know he was incredibly respected and, and adored by everybody who worked with him. And, and his stable was amazing. Mike McGreevy will have stories about that. Oh, that's good to know, because we're talking to Nancy Sue, his granddaughter, on Sunday. They're going to talk about the Cartwright horses and their multitude of names, it sounds like. <laughs> so we'll, we'll ask Mike about that tomorrow then. Um, what do you recall about Hal Baylor's charity endeavors? All the Cartwrights oh. participated in some autographed photos have surfaced in eBay recently. That's so true. That's so true. Hal Baylor 
it's like I said, going way back to when my dad met my mother was another part of my family life. And Hal would put together these wonderful charity events and they would be held at odd places like the home and auto show or, or the boat show in the LA convention center, huge, huge places. And he would get this portable stage and th this new founded thing called a Polaroid camera had just come out. <laughs> and for $5, which is a lot of money then, you could have your picture taken with any of these characters that were sitting up on this stage. You could pick one or as many as you wanted to and have your picture and get it right then and they would sign it for you. It was an ingenious idea. And the ones that are on eBay right now, if you, you can see if they flip them over, it'll say exactly what charity it was for. Oh. And so Hal did this constantly to help different children events there, you know, we even had orphanage still in, in LA at that point. So it could go to different, different kind of like the Ben Johnson children's autism rodeos and things. This was something that, that Hal Baylor did. And it was a mainstay in my life going to these bizarre places where Hal would put up the stage with the Polaroid camera. But it was, it was, again, it was just all the Western guys would get together and do it because that's what they did. They, they were there to help people. And they literally would just sit up on the stage and then somebody would walk up and say, I want my picture with so-and-so or. Yeah. yeah, they were just there for hours. Just, just, I didn't make them just, feel kind of cheap, like a, like they're walking into a brothel and I'll pick her or I'll pick her. Now that you mentioned it that way. <laughs> that seems kind of funny. They're all sitting there just kind of waiting and say, well, I'll pick him. Can I have a picture with him? It's <laughs> not on, on eBay. One of them was with Jimmy Hampton, who was Dobbs on F Troop. So I oh, let yeah? his wife. I let his wife know. I said, uh, they got some pictures of Jimmy up on eBay that are kind of cute. But it's, you know, it, it was it was sweet because it was the people that were really true fans and they could, it tickled them to death to be able to be standing next to them, talking to them, interacting with them and have this treasured keepsake that they could walk away with. So it was a win-win for everybody. But Hal was just, I adored Hal. I absolutely did. <laughs> Uh, did your uncle have good recollections of his early Western days with Bill Boyd, Hopalong Cassidy, and George Reeves, who later played Superman on TV? Both heard? Dad and Uncle Bob had photographic memories, which was kind of frustrating and intimidating as a kid. <laughs> but so they, they could not only um, tell you a story, but they would have every detail down to, to, what somebody had to drink while they were talking to them. Oh wow! So yeah, it was it was quite a challenge to keep up with them in a conversation, but but okay. uh, but Uncle Bob loved working with with Boyd. I mean, he and his his widow Gracie, Grace Boyd was just such a charming woman, and she would come up to Lone Pine every year until she passed away. But they were just absolutely loving people. I'm going on the trampoline. <laughs> people still go on the trampoline that's impressive oh i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> go ahead find that's the trampoline. My granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> we like her she tried to help earlier what about george reeves did you ever get to meet george reeves i did and he was a really good friend with another friend of my dad's natividad vasio and natty was in in the industry natty did a lot of bonanza um and they were very good friends. So it's all, like I said, it was all just a, a revolving door of great people. It's amazing. It sounds like they were just all so interconnected. Oh, they, so, so Andy wants to know, do you, do you actually have easy access to pick along's guitar to the famous riverboat the, guitar? It's in the cupboard behind me. Is it like on display or is it? Just <laughs> I had it on display, but right now it's, it's in my, in my, um, closet. I'll I'll show it to you next time so I don't walk away from the computer. But I, it's right there. <laughs> well, we might be showing a video here, so when we show a video, we'll uh, you can. That's I think it's about six minutes long. Yeah. Uh, let's see. He's got Hal Beller had all four Cartwrights plus Mitch appear at his shows. So, huh? That, so they got to be chosen from the <laughs> from the yeah oh yeah. And then Fuller was always there. Bob Fuller was always 
available to squeeze and hug a lady. <laughs> he still is. He'll be doing That's that till he's 150 years old. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Fuller, Fuller was always raising his hand for that duty. <laughs> he is the mayor of whatever. And now Darby's caught on. So De Darby's like the junior deputy to, to Robert Fuller. I think he's observed. <laughs> They're all missing their hugging, I think. <laughs> uh, they, they have to be going through withdrawals, something fierce. It was, I, I talked to LQ Jones last week. Uh -huh. And LQ's 93. Wow. And, and he is not holding up so well at this, oh. this point of this whole COVID thing because he hasn't left his house since March. And he doesn't have family? Is he there by himself? He's not letting anybody in except his housekeeper once a week to cook for him. Gotcha. And and he's he's gotten to the point where he won't even watch TV. I called to check on him during the riots that were going on and he didn't even know that they were rioting outside his house. <laughs> so, but LQ, who is always Mr. Upbeat and Happy, said I could use some uplift in the spirit, Cindy. So I'm having everybody who wants to send LQ a, a Christmas card, send it to me because he'll only take it from me. And then I'm going to put them all in a bigger bag and send them down to him so that he can have all the, all the Christmas cards from everybody who remembers who he is and wants to send him their love. Awesome. So we'll get that uh, address posted. So if anybody wants to participate in that and send LQ Jones some, some well wishes for Christmas and let him know that he is loved and not forgotten, as they say. <laughs> Well, he's, like I said, he's really missing the interaction of talking to people. And if if I was there to help him do something like this, it would be terrific. But he still has a dial-up phone. <laughs> dial? Oh, do you like it literally has a rotary phone? Yes. <laughs> and a flip phone? Does he even have a cell phone? No, he does not have a cell phone. Whoa, he is hardcore old school. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> he's LQ. <laughs> He doesn't have a nine-year-old granddaughter to come take care of it for him, I suppose. That's what John Collier was doing. His, his daughter, I think, was having to figure it out for him. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so that segues us into how are we doing for time? So it's eight o'clock. We got a little bit more time. Um, so you've been working on a project for your dad's poems and old recordings. Do you want, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Or do you want me to play the video? Well, I, I, I can put it in, in a really quick nutshell. Um, Dad wasn't just just an actor and a and a singer. He was also a poet. He was nominated for a Grammy for writing the only album that John Wayne ever recorded, "America Why I Love Her," which mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of you have heard. And when Dad passed away, Ernest Borgnine and L.Q. Jones. I mean, not LQ, AC Lyles, who was the producer at Paramount, took me aside and said that I had to do something special. So I kind of, well, I'm just going to put together a website. Not me, Steve. <laughs> My husband does all that. <laughs> and so they, they shook their head and they said, no, that's not good enough. And they said, the country needs to hear your father's poetry. Hmm. So I said, okay, what am I going to do? And Ernie said, I'll tell you what you're going to do, kid. You're going to have your dad's friends pick their favorite poem and record it, and I'll be the first one to do it. So that sounded like a pretty simple task. Well, 55 people got in touch with me over wow. the years. Who was, sure. them all, who was all letting them know? Were you letting them know or it's, were just, no, just word it's, of mouth? No, it's that grapevine of that tight-knit group that we're talking about, you know. Ernie got on the phone and said, hey, we're doing this for Mitch. And so everybody picked the poem or the song that they wanted to do. And my husband, Steve, has been putting music together underneath every single one of them. Wow. So, so we have, like, Ben Mankiewicz told me that it's not just – a uh, Hollywood who's who it's pure Americana and Leonard Malton said that there's never been a project of this magnitude and there never can be again because I mean, 55 people is pretty tremendous but we have people like Ernest Borgnine and Jane Russell and James Jury and Alex Cord and uh, we have oh um, Dean Smith, who was a stuntman, did it, and uh, we have David Huddleston did one, and LQ did one, and uh, it, the, 55 of them got, uh, you know, it, it took seven years to get Wilford Brimley into a studio, <laughs> not because Wilford didn't want to do it, but Wilford hates being in a town, so to find a, 
a small town that had a recording studio to get him into was a trick. So seven years for that one to happen. So it's just a remarkable tribute, not just to dad and his music, but to all of the beautiful people that have worked so hard to get it together and make it happen. So, so did you basically, did they pick the poem and then you would just make it happen? Like, do they all, do they all sing or do they all just, do they just no, speak it? Like do like a narration with music? There's, I think, 46 poems and eight songs. Um, Bing Crosby's grandson, Phil Crosby Jr., sang one of the songs. Uh, Susan Calsill from the Calsills did one song, and Susan did a duet with Dwight Twilley, another musician. And Randy Boone from the Virginian sang a song. So, and Stephen Arngrim sang a song. So everybody else has been doing uh, the, the poems, but they each picked one. And the, the title is John Mitchum's Unabashed Love of Country, Cowboys, and God. So some of them are Western, like James Gammon did one called The Cowboy, and Bruce Spockslightner did one called Desert Treasure, which is about Tombstone, Arizona. And Mike McGreevy picked one of the spiritual ones. Oh, and nice. and uh, Jane Russell did as well. And we had Ann Rutherford and Ann Jeffries each picked a different kind of a poem. So it's... It's just a wide gamut of, of emotions and, and obviously all the patriotic ones that were on the John Wayne album and then some. So um, Ernie picked a thing called An American Boy Grows Up and Andy Prine picked Why Are You Marching Son, which is the poem that dad recited for John Wayne that made John Wayne actually cry. Aww. And David Huddleston did The Hyphen. Alex Cord did Miss Raisa Sistana Key. And um, well, the biggie is Robert Duvall did Robert Duvall, America, yeah, Robert why Duvall. I love her, right? Thank you. Yeah, Duvall did <laughs> why I love her, and the Sons of the Pioneers did the music underneath it. Oh, wow, was that his idea or was that your idea? That was my idea because I grew up with the Pioneers, they were they were all dear friends of dad's, and it just seemed perfect that that would be the right blend to go with that. Gotcha. Well, I know we have a little promo video that we could play, so maybe we'll take a little quick break and play okay. <laughs> play the promo and I'll then get uh, the guitar. <laughs> I'll be right back. I think it's only a few minutes long, but it gives a little sample of each of a couple of the different people that are on it. And we can see how what it sort of sounds like. You might have to mute your camera and your microphone okay. when I bring it up. So let me see if I can find it first. I shouldn't have Tombstone, Arizona, a well of history, surrounded by a brooding desert, a land of mystery, seemingly lifeless yet surprisingly alive with the hordes of little creatures who managed to survive the awesome heat of the day and the chill. On a trail drive from Texas down by the Rio Grande, we pushed across the Midas to a strange and bitter land that where before the Longhorns streamed along, Grass Range once was there. Now we herded them in silence with a feeling. Country songs don't have to be about honky-tonks and bars, of broken hearts and long-lost loves and fast lives and fast cars. They can be about the country. That's what country is. You ask how come I call my old mule Ruth, when in fact the solemn truth is he's a jack and not no Jenny, that's for sure. Well, there's no call for you to know, but since you ask, I'll tell you. So just settle back and heed to what I say. It started in 1861. Baby child is made from the earth, like the book says, we're all made of clay. And his soil lies foul from the time of his birth, pure and sweet as a new light of day. The farmer plants. 
The scout looked down and saw ravine so vast and wide and deep. His breath came hard, his eyes grew cold. He knew there would be no sleep for him or for the men who had their women and children near. He knew that there could be no slackening. He knew there could be no... Oh, I've ridden a horse or two across the movie screen. I'm not the typical cowboy. I'm not lanky, nor am I lean. I rode horses on Bonanza, Chisholm, and Cattle King. And once in a while, to be like Roy, I'd just rear back and sing. But the horse that I remember most was back in World War II. I don't really like... <laughs> We hear a lot about war, of hurricanes that hit our shore. We hear a lot about hard times and a good deal more about the crimes that make the front pages of our news. But all that does is sing the blues about America. Now what are the good things? An ode to my dog. He was fearsome. He was playful. He was hard-nosed. He was kind. When he'd settle down beside me, he'd be gentle on my mind. He had dignity and wisdom. He walked with studied grace. He learned the key to the hearts of children, for the child in him has never died. No matter how hard the road he traveled, his peers would say, well, Monty tried. He traveled the world with his ropes and horses, meeting kings and queens and presidents, too. The Tournament of Roses never really got started until Monty Montana passed by. <laughs> so that's a little bit of sampling. So how many different, there's 50, 50 what? 55, 55 tracks. And then you so, said there's also a booklet. So is, is this CD set finally finished? The CD is off and being final mastered right now. So that's a very exciting process. And what we're doing is because people have been so eager to get it is that we are going to create a little cloud room so that while people are waiting for the actual CD to be processed because it's going to have a 24 page booklet inside of the two disc package. So, which is a whole nother process in itself. It's, you know, that's it's because with all the people that have put their time and love and energy into this, they deserve more than just a little tiny line that people can't read in, in six point font. So we're doing a booklet with pictures of them and, and pictures of the process of, of over the years of getting this done. You asked how it was done. Um, Herb Jeffries, who was the first black singing cowboy, the bronze buckaroo, did it in his living room. Um, and But Jim Jury went straight off to the University of Houston and had them record it in their recording studio. And Dean Smith had someone come out to his ranch out in Texas and do a video and record them. Oh, and wow. yeah, so it it's just was depending on who the person was and how they wanted to do it. If they were somewhat close by me, I would gather about eight or 10 of them together and we'd go into the studio together and do it and have a whole day and then go out to dinner and have a grand time. Uh, with Robert Duvall, Steve and I flew out to his house and, and actually did the recording in a beautiful studio there. And then he totally surprised us and invited us to his house for an Argentinian barbecue, oh, which wow. was, which was a great thrill and a delight. So it's, it's a, it's a cobbled together. It wasn't, nothing is exactly the same and it shows the love and the, the personality of each person that actually did it. And if somebody wanted, can people still place orders for it? Oh, absolutely. We're just, we just started taking the orders. So is that your way, website or is that preferred? The website, is, is, the website will be up and coming. Uh, so through Facebook or through just through my email, which is real simple to get in touch with me. It's mitchamedia at gmail.com. I'm easy. easy to find. <laughs> I'm, I'm very easy to find. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm on Facebook and, and there's a Facebook page for the CD where I keep putting up pictures and things like that. So it's John Mitchum's Unabashed Love of Country, Cowboys, and God. <laughs> it's a nice big long title. I like it. <laughs> it's, well, it's kind of what it is though, you know? It's, it's not, you know, he, he was proud of all of those things. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, I know we need to wrap it up here, but on a final promise that you, did you find the guitar? I did. So, um, Steve, can you grab the guitar out of the cupboard? 
<laughs> we all want to see the guitar. You, you can see the guitar. It's it's a very. Oh, special I should see if I can show that picture real quick while he's doing that. If I can find it, that. Well, another funny thing while he's getting it, I'll tell you that I had loaned it to Burt Reynolds, and Burt had it in his yeah. uh, museum down in Florida. And then when Bert got sick and everything started crumbling in that direction, somebody came in and was going to auction off everything that belonged to Bert in the museum, and they took my guitar. <gasps> oh, no. And it was on loan to the museum. So that took a whole other network of friends and, and family and people from Texas and people from, from L.A. all working together and getting the guitar and so that I could get it back. So it's back with me now. So the person who bought it wasn't wanting to really Nobody give it Nobody bought up? it. Oh. I, I got, I was told, somebody got a notice of, they actually, because they were Burt Reynolds fans, they got one of the auction catalogs and they saw that dad's guitar was in it. So they notified me before the auction started. Oh, that's good news. Yeah. <laughs> that's a so, happy ending. Okay, let me see if I can first show the picture from the set. This is uh, on the Bonanza set. Let's see. So that's what, that's your dad and Lauren and Purnell? And yeah. that's the that's the riverboat guitar that they're all that's, looking at. Yep. And this is it the guitar we're about have, to see. It used to have a lot of like like soft leather fringe coming off of it. <laughs> okay. Da -da 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 -da. Here's the guitar. Oh wow. For some reason I thought it was like colorful, like it was <laughs> that's funny. It, it, it is painted. It's hand painted here. Wow. All of this is hand painted. Um, I don't know if you can really see it. I'll I'll get better pictures of you for you. Okay, that's cool. But see, there's the riverboat right there. So what do you think you're going to do with it? I just went to Nashville and went to the Country Music Hall of Fame. Have you thought about donating it to them? Well, I don't know if they'd want it. I don't know. But it's 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 um, a true piece of Americana, you know. And I love the scenes with Dad and Mike McGreevy with the guitar. Oh, there you go. That would be fun, wouldn't it? You have to. That'll be a good reason for you to get together with Mike. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd get together with Mike in a heartbeat. I adore Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Who you all can meet on Saturday night from seven to nine Eastern Standard Time, where we watch Gabrielle when he was just a little boy. <laughs> Mike started in the business when he was very little. Yeah. And like I said, he was, he got to marry Sally Fields on the way west. Oh, well, that's which not was a her bad way to go. First, that was her first film, was the way west. And he married her, huh? And he married her, <laughs> yep. Like I said, I, I've known these guys all my life, so it's kind of fun. Well, I appreciate you putting me in touch with him, and I definitely appreciate your patience and your time and your information, and we'll make sure we post some links so that if people want to get in touch with you about the CD, uh, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic and sell a ton. Well, thank so you. Thank you. There's a lot of love in it, just like there was on the Bonanza set. <laughs> Well, thank you. So everybody, we're all headed back to air meet. We'll may take, maybe take a poll to see what everybody wants to do as it's getting later here. We all have a long day tomorrow. But Cindy, thank you again for your time. Oh, You're you. a terrific person. Thank your husband for getting your microphone working. That was terrific. Well, yeah, the very, the very little button inside the computer. Yeah, <laughs> that's all it takes. But you have a great right. night and you stay safe. You. And uh, we hope to see you around. And if you want to stop in on any of the social lounges and chat with people, you are definitely I welcome. I would love to. I will. Thank All you right. very much. You take I'll care. Good night. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye-bye.